Questions? Did you get an email from uh, Joel Novotny about access to making medicines? My email, but I thought she said she sent out something. I saw something the other day that said it was spam. Yeah, but it had making medicines on it. I don't think it was from Jill necessarily, but I don't know if that might be an issue. Okay, uh, what I will do is I will have her forward it to me and then I will send it off through uh, Google to you. Because she would said, I think on Friday, that she sent out the information that showed you how you got access to it. Do you think it ended up in spam? Yeah, because I have that. I don't think it is, though. I don't think it is. Okay, okay. I will check with that. I'm glad I, glad I checked on that. Okay, so you ready to get your unknown tomorrow? Sure. Okay, um, <laughs> the material that we're going to cover for the next few days is a great lead up to lab and the unknown project and the ultimate goal of the unknown project which is to identify a culture of microorganisms like the human lab. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about uh, bacterial classification systems and use that as a vehicle to talk about Bergen's manual which you'll become very familiar with as you work with your unknown. Bacterial classification systems, and really any classification system, really contains two aspects that we need to be aware of. And one is, is that to put things into a classification system, they have to be assigned names. And so naming organisms, the process of nomenclature, is part of the bacterial classification process. The other part of the bacterial classification process is grouping things into groups or taxa. So who do we owe our kind of uh, credit to the development of the first classification system for living organisms? Those of you that have bought me, I'm sure Dr. Hank is talking about this. We made the first formal system of classification. Remember Linnaeus? Carolus Linnaeus? That's the Linnaean system of classification. And that particular system of classification was based upon assigning all organisms particular names. It is called a binomial system of classification. Binomial means two names. What are the two names that we assign all organisms in a Linnaean classification system? What is the scientific name of the system? Genus and species. Okay, so genus and species are two of the taxa. Linnaeus um, was very forward thinking in his understanding that a binomial formal classification system was really, really important for scientific communication. Because prior to the Linnaean system of classification, everything was given a common name. What is the problem with assigning common names to organisms? Well, you won't see the connections between organisms, and it would be hard to keep track at some point. Okay, you might not see the connections between organisms, and those connections emerge from things being put into taxa or groups, and so that's true. What's another weakness of a common name system? Uh, yeah, a lot of people have different common names for the same organism. So in one part of the world, something might be a red oak. There might be a totally different plant in another part of the world that's also a red oak. So how do you know what you're talking about? How can you scientifically communicate if you use these common names, which are subject to uh, confusion and duplication? But Quercus rubra, red oak, around the world is the same organism, okay? So it gives a standardization. Linnaean system of classification breaks things down into several descending groups. What is the most inclusive group in the Linnaean system of classification? The largest, most umbrella group. The highest taxon. 
A stand for? Kingdom, right? What is the next group below kingdom? Phylum or in botany, division? Class, order, family, genus, species. Okay. So the heart of the Linnaean classification system is assigning Latin or Latinized binomial names to all living organisms and then putting them into groupings. And these groupings illustrate relationships. That's something Arthur was talking about. Okay. So things that are in the same order are more similar than things that are in different orders. And one of the things that classification systems oftentimes achieve and strive to achieve is to show or demonstrate phylogenetic relationships. Can't spell. What does phylogenetic relationship refer to? Yeah. It refers to evolutionary relationships. Okay. So a good classification system is not just a grouping system, but it's also a system that tends to point out trends of similarity and dissimilarity evolutionarily among living organisms. Now, not all classification systems are great at doing that, and that's one of the tensions that we'll talk about. So why do we need a classification system? What prompted Linnaeus to develop this formal taxonomic system? Well, taxonomic systems are designed to start to bring some sense of order out of the world of complexity. Okay. So there's a lot of different species of different organisms out there in the world, right? And if we're going to start to study them and talk about them and communicate about them, then we need this system of grouping them so we can start getting some sense of what belongs where and how they're related to one another. Is there a need for some type of a classification system for bacteria? Is there a lot of complexity in the microbial world? Yeah, there is. And much more complexity than we believe ever existed even as short a period of time as a decade ago. Okay. Um, up until about a decade ago, most people agreed that there were thousands, tens of thousands maybe, of different types of bacteria and bacterial life. And that's enough complexity and diversity in and of itself to merit some kind of an organizing system for these particular groups of organisms. But one of the things we're discovering is that those several thousand species that we've identified to date are just the proverbial tip of the iceberg, and that there are scads more, millions probably more, different species of bacteria that haven't been identified to date. One of the problems is that our ability to identify microorganisms has traditionally been based upon our ability to grow them in a laboratory environment. And what we're finding is, is that most organisms that are out there in nature don't really grow well in lab environments. But because of new genetic techniques, we're now starting to find that the number of species of bacteria that we've identified is just a tiny drop in the ocean of the actual number of species that they are. And so that argues even more for some kind of an organizing system for the classification of microorganisms. I was going to ask you, I was going to ask you, if it's because we ha hadn't had a chance to like, find them, or is it because we introduced like new chemicals and drugs and stuff? Um, it's primarily the fact that we uh, just really didn't know where to look and we didn't really understand how diverse of environments microorganisms could even exist in. I mean, who would think to look in a pile of coal slag that had a pH of 1 
for microbial communities and populations. But they're there. And then the other big consideration is what I just said, identification and grouping primarily was a product of can I grow it in the lab and identify it? And most things just don't grow well in the lab. Okay, so there's a couple of things going on there. Um, classification systems kind of suffer from two somewhat conflicting um, purposes. And one of the reasons to have a classification system is to facilitate identification of microorganisms. Identification of microorganisms, particularly pathogens, is really important in medicine. Because if you don't know what particular species of bacteria is affecting your patient, then you won't know the best treatment to give that patient. Okay? So there's some real importance in being able to identify and assign a name to a microorganism. So that's kind of a practical <coughs> purpose of identification systems, or classification systems, sorry. There's another kind of more academic purpose of classifications as well, classification systems as well. And that is to start to try to tease out and figure out what is the evolutionary relationship between the organisms that we're studying. What gave rise to what? Which are close cousins? Which are distant cousins? And what is that kind of evolutionary tree of life that gave rise to all of this diversity of microorganisms? It's really difficult for a classification system to be good at both of these things, at practically naming things and yet at the same time showing phylogenetic or evolutionary relationships between those things. And we'll talk a little bit about why that's the case in just a minute. So we've talked a little bit about why is it important to be able to identify bacteria. What problems might you face in trying to identify a bacteria? And this might be much more um, answerable by you now that you've looked at a few slides of bacteria. What are some issues with putting a name to a bacteria? Okay, they're really small and they're really hard to see. And even when you look at them, a lot of them look alike, okay? There are tons and tons of little tiny short gram-negative rods that all look identical to one another visually. And yet there are many different genus and species of gram-negative rods. And so they're just small size and their kind of sameness makes it really difficult to identify those particular organisms. So what strategies might we use to identify them? Well, we might look at them under the microscope so we can see them better. And we've also been talking about ways that we can stain the microorganisms to try to determine if they have particular attributes. Okay? It's one thing for us to look around the room and say, um, there are different kinds of organisms in this room. And some of them are males and some of them are females. And some have different colored hair and different colored eyes or different heights. But when you start looking at microorganisms, they all pretty much look the same. They don't even have the concept of male and female in the bacterial world, okay? And some of the attributes that they have that might allow us to start separating them into different groups are very difficult to discern unless we do some of these staining procedures to find out if it's acid fast or not acid fast, to find out if it has endospores or doesn't have endospores. Um, this is an example of a classification system that has been developed for the identification of medically important bacteria. And this particular classification system 
is very practical in nature, and its primary goal is to facilitate the identification of the microorganisms. I apologize, the printing on this is really small. I can't read it without getting right up to it. But one of the things that you'll see is that much of the basis of the organization of this particular classification system is based upon morphological characteristics. So things like bacteria with a gram-positive cell wall or gram bacteria with a gram-negative cell wall or bacteria that lack a cell wall. Okay, so we can go gram and determine that. Within this particular group of bacteria with the gram-negative cell wall, one of the things that you see that's also used to separate organisms out is their cellular morphology. So are the cells cocci or are they bacillus? Okay, another morphological characteristic. Some further criteria that are used in this particular system have to do with a physiological characteristic. Are these organisms aerobic or are they anaerobic? Okay, so in addition to morphology, sometimes we use a little physiology for separating things out into different groups. In this particular group up here, the gram positives, do they form endospores or do they not form endospores? So these practical systems are very heavily dependent upon morphological characteristics, and to a lesser extent, some physiology of the cells. This particular system does not even begin to address kind of the academic side of a classification system. And the groupings of these particular microorganisms make no pretense that things in one group are phylogenetically related to members of another group. Okay. So how do we develop a classification system that kind of works well for both of those particular purposes? It's difficult and it's been particularly a challenge in the microbial world. What's so problematic about the microbial world? Well, one of the big things that is problematic in the microbial world has to do with our definition of species. What's typically the criteria for things being members of different species in traditional Linnaean classification. They can't reproduce with any other species. Okay, yep, they can't interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Okay, that's typically the criteria to be members of different species is this reproductive isolation. Bacteria don't reproduce sexually. And yet, bacteria are able to fairly frequently exchange genes by the process of conjugation. So if they can exchange genes, should they be considered to be members of the same species? What we're going to see when we talk about evolution of antibiotic resistance is that there are vastly different species of bacteria. And E. coli, for example, which is a gram-negative rod, and a staph, which is a gram-positive cocci, that can exchange genes via plasmas through conjugation. They're clearly considered in bacterial taxonomy to be different species.
but should they be if they can exchange genes? And so this really kind of creates some problems in developing a bacterial classification system is this whole just idea of the concept of a species. Early attempts to develop a bacterial classification system were based upon the five kingdom approach to classification. So kingdom animal, plant, fungi, protista, and monera, all bacteria would be placed in that fifth division of the five, fifth kingdom of the five kingdom system, the kingdom monera. But now we've talked about an alteration to that particular strategy and the three domain system. So which particular type of strategy should a bacterial classification system employ? Should it use a five kingdom approach or a three domain approach? Well, as it turns out, bacterial classification systems have been changing and evolving as we've been transitioning over to this more widely accepted three domain approach to classification. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. So there's been a lot more kind of upheaval in bacterial classification than there has been in plant or animal classification. There hasn't been this big revolution in the organization of plants and animals, kingdoms versus domains, that has existed within the last couple of decades in bacterial classification. So that's a challenge and a complicating factor as well. So we've already talked about the five kingdom approach classification and the three domain approach, so we don't need to go back through that anymore. So what are some of the tools that have traditionally been used to try to develop bacterial classification systems? To put things into groups and assign them names. Well, we've seen that some of the practical systems of classification have de depended very heavily on microscopic morphology. In addition to microscopic morphology, one of the things that's also sometimes used is colonial morphology. You all comfortable with the concept of what a colony is? Okay. A colony is just a mass of cells, all of which arose from cell division of an original parent cell. So if you had a single cell contaminating your auger plate, and you let that plate sit in the incubator for a few days, that cell divides over and over and over again, and starts to form a visible mass that you can see. And some of the ways in which the colonies grow, their shape, what does their edge or margin look like, what does their color look like, are species-specific characteristics. And so we can use colonial morphologies as well as cellular morphologies to start separating bacteria into different groups or taxa. Um, physiological information is sometimes useful. Um, toward the end of the first section of lab, prior to the first lab exam, one of the things that we will do with your unknown and some known organisms is determine their ability to utilize oxygen in respiration. And we'll determine whether your microorganism is aerobic, whether it is anaerobic, whether it is facultatively anaerobic, whether it is aerotolerant, whether it is a capnophile, there's all kinds of kind of attributes that an organism can have that helps to describe the ways in which it can utilize oxygen and other gases. And we can use those as criteria, just like we would use morphology as criteria, to start separating organisms into different taxa or different groups. One of the characteristics that um, has gained a lot of um, use in the last several decades has been the use of biochemical characteristics of the cell. And a lot of the biochemistry has to do with what foods can a microorganism utilize, what can it eat, and what products can it produce? What is that a reflection of? Ultimately, that is a reflection of the enzymes that the bacteria produce. 
For example, there are some bacteria that can ferment sucrose. And when they ferment sucrose, they might produce acid as a byproduct. Okay. Well, that's a characteristic, just like morphology is a characteristic. It's something that can be used to put things into different groupings. Why can some organisms ferment sucrose and others can't? Because some organisms have the enzymes that allow them to do it, others don't. One of the enzymes you need to ferment sucrose is the enzyme sucrase. You've got to break that disaccharide down into monosaccharides before you can then ferment it into acid or alcohol or whatever you're going to ferment it into. Well, what are enzymes really a reflection of? What determines what enzymes you can make? Your genes. And what are genes a good reflection of? Evolutionary relationships, phylogeny. The more closely things are related, the more common ancestor they have, then the more similarity they should have genetically. One of the tools that can be very useful in starting to identify and group microorganisms is serological analysis. Serological analysis involves the use of antibody molecules. Y'all know what an antibody is? Antibodies are proteins that combine very specifically with a particular type of molecule called an antigen. If different species of bacteria have different surface molecules, different antigens on their surface, then those different molecules will react with different antibodies. So antibodies can actually be used to very specifically pick out certain types of organisms that have certain types of surface molecules. And so this serological testing using antibodies was a real breakthrough in the process of developing another tool that was useful in bacterial identification and classification. Over on the right are some of the more recent techniques that have been used to dig further into identifying microorganisms and separating them out into various groups. And these have to do with genetic characteristics. Now remember, the more insight we can get into genes, the more insight we can get into evolutionary relationships. Think about this for a second. What is your morphology basically a reflection of? Morphology is a very complex concept. Basically shape or structure. And that's the reflection of several different enzymatic reactions, several different enzymes reacting with one another. It's kind of a function of your entire metabolism almost. So enzymes are kind of a more phylogenetic tool than morphology is. But the genes that encode enzymes keep you closer yet to true discerning of evolutionary relationships. So this is basically the gold standard for showing phylogeny. This is kind of one removed from genes, because enzymes are the product of genes. This is two or three times removed, because morphology is a complex outcome of a lot of metabolic interactions. So this is very far away from showing evolutionary relationships. This is closer. This is closer yet. Okay. And what did some of our earliest classification systems develop? Depend upon morphology. And so they were very poor at doing this. Now, as we move to more genetic analysis, we're getting closer to a system that not only identifies, but also shows those phylogenetic or evolutionary relationships. What are some of the genetic tools that have been used? 
Well, one that was used fairly early on was a concept called GC base, con uh, base composition. GNC obviously referred to guanine cytosine. What is a fundamental way that GC base pairs differ from AT base pairs? GC base pairs have three bonds. AT base pairs have two. What do those hydrogen bonds do to the stability of a DNA double helix? More hydrogen bonds, more stable or less stable? That makes intuitive sense. More stable. Okay. So what you can actually do is you can take DNA molecules and you can subject them to increasing temperature. And what happens at a certain point when you reach a certain critical temperature? The DNA double helix separates. And you can actually tell that if you're monitoring the absorbance of that DNA solution because the absorbance changes dramatically when the double helix separates into two strands. So you can, for every DNA molecule you isolate, construct something called a DNA melting curve. And it shows basically at what temperature the DNA double helix separates. What are the different profiles of the different DNA melting curves determined by? how much G and C you have in your DNA. If you've got a lot of G and C, your melting curve is going to have a higher temperature than if you have a lot of A and T. So this is a very kind of crude tool to give you some insight into base pair composition of DNA of the different species. How much G, C it has versus how much A, T it has. It's pretty crude though, but it was used. Really, kind of the gold standard for genetic analysis is actually sequencing the DNA of the species. And not only saying it has 60% GC and 40% AT, that's pretty crude, but saying here's the sequences of ATs, Gs, and Cs. What precluded widespread use of gene sequencing to start identifying and classifying microorganisms? Why couldn't we use this until very recently? It took a long time to do it, and it was really expensive. Until the Human Genome Project brought about the technologies that made gene sequencing dirt cheap. You can sequence uh, the entire genome of a bacterial species now in, I'm just guessing, less than a week with no problem, and for probably well less than a thousand bucks. This has been aided by automation, use of supercomputers to kind of put all the data together, and sequencing just continues to drop in price. It's kind of like uh, computer memory. Computer memory just gets cheaper and cheaper relative to the size of the memory gene sequencing prices just go down and down and down. Well, because bacterial classification systems has its own complications, the history of the development of bacterial classification systems is quite a bit different than the Linnaean system of classification. The primary tool that has been used in bacterial classification and identification is a set of published manuals called Berge's Manuals. This particular slide shows you the evolution of Berge's Manual back to its inception in 1923 up through its current iteration which was completed, the last volume of this was completed in 2012. A couple of things that are important in this particular slide right here. And one is, is that there are two kinds of Bergie's manuals. One are the manuals that are called manuals of determinative bacteriology. 
and those that are called manuals of systematic bacteriology. The determinative manuals are primarily put together for practical purposes and as aids for identification of microorganisms. Very little attempt, especially in the early editions of these, to even try to show any phylogenetic relationships. These types of manuals are considered to be phonetic in nature. Basically, that's just another way of saying they're primarily identification tools. They're very, very poor in doing any kind of phylogenetic work. The systematic manuals of bacteriology are now making the attempt to bridge that gap between identification and phylogeny. And so we'll talk a little bit about the evolution of those particular manuals as more and more interest developed in having a system that was not just a practical identification system, but one that also gave us that evolutionary insight. Now, you don't have to memorize all of these dates and names and things up here, but there are some things that I'm going to point out, and I'll try to highlight for you which ones are kind of exam worthy and which ones aren't. So, the determinative bacteriology manuals go back all the way to 1923. The most recent one was 1994. There are nine of these nine editions. Each consists of a single volume. And again, these are mainly identification. They're mainly phonetic in nature. In a period of time between 84 and 89, the first edition of systematics bacteriology developed. Four volumes now, not one. So more organisms. This particular set of volumes, the first edition of systematics, is kind of schizoid. It really suffers between trying to be a good identification tool and at the same time also showing what are the evolutionary relationships between those organisms. And to be honest with you, it kind of uh, failed in both regards. It's not particularly good for either thing. Fast forward a couple of decades, and between 2001 and 2012, a second edition of systematics was developed, consisting of five volumes, more organisms were known, and this really was a much more phylogenetic system. This one kind of abandoned the idea that we're going to use this for identification. We're not even going to try. Another significant difference between the first edition of systematics and the second edition is that this one is based upon the five kingdom system of classification. This one is based upon the three domain system of classification. So what we're going to do in the next couple of days is we're going to kind of go through some of these things. Berge's Manual of Determinative Bacteriology is the one you're primarily going to use for identification of your unknown. And particularly, there are two editions of that, that you're going to use extensively, and we'll talk about those. Some of the earlier editions, they're not in print anymore. We don't have them. So there's really just a couple of these nine editions we're going to be using extensively. This one I'm going to talk about kind of philosophically a little bit. We have two of these four volumes. The reason we don't have the other two is that they contain organisms we just never use in lab or encounter. And the second edition of systematics, we don't have any of those. Because this really isn't kind of the bailiwick of this course. We're not really an evolutionary microbiologist. 
weren't really kind of more of a practical identification kind of microbiological. So I don't have the second edition. I wouldn't have any plans to get it. It's just not relevant to what we study here. Okay, so let's take a look at the phonetic volumes, the Burgess Manual of Determinative Bacteriology. Again, first edition way back in 1923. Ninth edition in 1994. We're going to primarily use three of those editions in your identification. And the one we're going to use most extensively is the seventh edition. So this is going to become kind of your Bible. There are uh, six or seven copies of this in the cabinet over there. Um, I ask that you not take these out of the out of barns. Preferably use them in here, but sometimes students have taken them into the lounge and things. But when you identify your unknown, it's going to be required that you use at least Bergie seventh page, seventh edition. Now this is available online as well, and if you just Google Bergie seventh uh, edition it will come up. But it's a little bit cumbersome to use, particularly in the early stages of identification. Once you get down to a particular genus and a few species, then you can use online birdies without too much problem. But just going through basically it's a big PDF and it's not a searchable PDF. And so it's kind of difficult to use it online. But if you get in a pinch, that is available. Um, the eighth edition is also quite useful. I'm going to recommend that when you do your identification, once you have come to a tentative identification with the 7th edition, you try to verify that with the 8th edition. This has a little bit different kind of information in it than this does. The 7th edition is very, very dependent upon morphological characteristics of cells, colonial characteristics of cells, physiological characteristics, particularly oxygen utilization. And a lot of this biochemistry, what food molecules do things use? Can they break down the food? What kind of products do they produce? Okay. So this is really kind of the stuff we're going to be doing in lab to evaluate your unknown. Up until the first exam, much of the emphasis is going to be on staining techniques to uh, show you different morphology characteristics of your unknown. And that's information heavily used in the seventh edition. And then after uh, the first lab exam, which is right about at the middle of the semester, we're going to shift over and do a lot of biochemical tests. So you're going to do glucose fermentation, fructose fermentation, sucrose fermentation, and all these different things to try to discern what enzymes your particular microorganisms possess. Because that will be a useful characteristic in putting things into different genus and species. Okay? The eighth edition has a lot of that same type of information, but it's updated. Okay? It was done in 1975 versus 1957. So this is more updated information. But what this also contains is some of the first elements of trying to do some serology testing. And so you'll see reference to antibody reactions in here. And also some simple genetic analysis in the form of GC content. And so you'll see relevant, you'll see reference to that in here as well. We won't determine GC content of your unknown in lab. We won't do any serological testing. And so for us, this information, this additional information is kind of useless. But it, there is kind of an updated category, battery of tests for some of the biochemical tests. So you might find this useful. Ideally, if you can get a same answer as the species in this edition and this edition, that's what you're really shooting for. Okay? Now, the ninth edition, you may or may not choose to use that much. The ninth edition was done in 1994. And if you go back here to this history, 
you see that the first edition of Systematics was done in 84. Remember that I said that this was kind of a nightmare? That this first edition of Systematics was trying to do two things at once? Identification and evolutionary relationships? So what the Burgess Trust finally decided was, this is a nightmare. And people are really, really critical of this because this particular set of volumes is a lousy identification tool. So basically what they did was they pulled some of the identification in information out of the systematics and made a ninth edition of determinative. So this is kind of a condensation of part of first systematics. It pulled out all of the information that dealt with identification and left all the stuff that had to do with phylogeny out and developed this kind of ninth edition for identification only. These particular editions right here, especially the seventh one, use a lot of dichotomous keys. This one uses a lot of dichotomous keys as well, but then also has instead used a lot of comparative charts. The charts is a different way to organize the information than I got in the school. The use of charts has become kind of the rule in this ninth edition, and it's basically filled with all of these charts that show all of the relative biochemical information for different species of microorganisms. This can be good for verification. But a good dichotomous key is the easiest way to start identifying microorganisms. Now, let me give you a uh, kind of um, something you can kind of be relieved about. If I told you you had to identify your unknown entirely using Bergy 7, it would be a nightmare. Because the keys in this that give you the breakdown of things into family, genus, species, etc., are really, really hard to use. And much of the information we don't have access to. So what I've done for you in your lab manual is I've developed an abbreviated shortened key to microorganisms to the genus level. And that is all based upon the information we will gather in lab. So when you start identifying your microorganism, once you have some gram stain reactions and some metabolic reactions, you will use that genus key in the lab manual to identify the genus. And then once you have the genus identified, you will use Bergie's 7th edition to then identify it to species within that genus. So it's going to make your life a whole lot easier. Okay? Well, we're out of time, and I'm sure I totally confused you. Uh, we will continue to talk about this and try to work through the complexities of Bergie's manual. So, street planning tomorrow, floor planning tomorrow. Uh, you'll get your unknown and you'll start to do some subculturing of it for some upcoming tests on Friday.